I used to have a house about 20 miles from where I live now. It was in a wooded area with not much sunlight, so there was no chance of growing vegetables. The only flowers that grew well there were daylilies. An interesting flower known by its genus name, Hemerocallis, from the Greek words imera, meaning day, and kalos, meaning beautiful. Each bud produces a flower that blooms for only one day, although each stem can be loaded with buds. I never took time to improve or fertilize the soil much, and basically what we have in this part of the country is red clay. Yet the daylilies managed and grew with very little care outside of weeding and a layer of mulch. They bloomed faithfully every year, and I collected over a hundred different varieties. Really, that's not so many. When I started my collection, there were 40,000 varieties of daylilies. Now hybridizers have developed 80,000 cultivars. Later, I gave that house up, and my friend had put in a garden where she lives. She had especially put extra nutrients and good soil in her beds. We made a few rescue missions to my old house and dug in places where I remembered the nicest flowers were planted. In the end, we managed to salvage about a third of the varieties, and we planted them at her place. Daylilies are very forgiving for transplanting at any time. In fact, if you buy them from any grower who ships them, you receive bare roots in a box with shredded newspaper. They can live in a bucket of water for weeks or even months. The first year in my friend's yard was pretty good. Most of the plants produced foliage and later flowered. But by the second year, many had multiplied three and four times, and the flowers were bigger and more lush than ever. Some of the blooms were about three times the size of what I had seen at my place. Of course, it's all about the soil. How many times are we as human beings compared to trees and other plants in the scriptures? Speaking of the blessed man, it says in Psalm 1, 3, And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water, that brings forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he does shall prosper. Or when Yeshua began to heal the blind man, his first reaction was recorded in Mark eight twenty four, And he, that is a blind man, looked up and said, I see men as trees walking. Men are like trees physically. We both have a trunk or a torso. We both have limbs. We bear fruit. Or from Isaiah sixty five twenty two. They shall not build and another inhabit, they shall not plant and another eat. For as the days of a tree are the days of my people, and mine elect shall long enjoy the work of their hands. Yeshua talked about the state of our soil in the parable of the sower. Reading from Matthew thirteen nineteen through 23 When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and understands it not, then comes the wicked one and catches away that which was sown in his heart. This is he which received seed by the wayside. But he that received the seed into stony places, the same as he that hears the word, and anon with joy receives it. Yet has he not root in himself, but endures for a while. For when tribulation or persecution arises because of the word, by and by he is offended. He also that received seed among the thorns is he that hears the word, and the care of this world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word, and he becomes unfruitful. But he that received seed into the good ground is he that hears the word and understands it, which also bears fruit and brings forth some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. The condition of the soil informs us of the outcome of the plant. As Yeshua explains in Luke 8.11, Now the parable is this, The seed is the word of God. Going back to Genesis, we understand the principle of the seed. Genesis 1.12 And the earth brought forth grass, and herb yielding seed after his kind, and the tree yielding fruit, whose seed was in itself after his kind. And God saw that it was good. The seed is in the fruit, and that seed, when properly developed and matured, produces more of the same. This is true for the word of God. In the parable of the sower, in the instance of the first seed, we see that it is not really sown in soil at all. It is perhaps carelessly dropped on the footpath. People walk on it in ignorance. It is shuffled underfoot here and there, and it cannot take root. It will be stolen away by some hungry bird before it can begin to grow. 
Perhaps, like me, you first heard the gospel along the wayside, but treated it with disdain and tromped upon it. My friend had carefully sifted all the rocks out of the garden soil before she planted anything. As we have seen, seeds cannot germinate in stony soil. There is no warm, moist environment to nurture the seed and encourage its roots to spring out. Some hear the gospel, but their hearts are hardened, and there are no resources from which the seed's root may draw nourishment and encouragement. No faith can begin to grow, even though the hearer received the news with joy. Perhaps he has already made up his mind that this news, although sounding good, is not for him. Perhaps someone told him that his life would now be a bed of roses, but he finds out in short order that that precept is just not true. The third soil has thorns and weeds that choke the growth of the seed. Yeshua says they are the cares of this world and its riches. In the garden bed, weeds compete for the nutrients in the soil and for water. Here we go out every few days and make sure the beds are weed-free so the plants can flourish. Too often the things of this world compete for our attention and we are not properly spiritually fed. Our spiritual man languishes for lack of good nutrition while we pay attention to worldly temptations which promise that which only Yehovah can supply through his word and through communion with him. There are three ways of keeping the weeds out. We can crowd them out, we can starve them out, or we can cast them out. If we have many, many good plants, they develop a strong root system and will take the nutrition away from the weeds, although initially the weed is going to be stronger. We can starve them out by having so many good plants whose leaves provide a canopy over the soil, or we cover the soil with lots of mulch and thereby prevent the weeds from getting sunshine. Finally, we can cast them out by pulling them. We find the same system will work for negative spiritual influences in our lives. We can crowd them out with praise and worship and Bible verses. We water ourselves with the water of the word. It is written in Ephesians 5.26 that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. We draw our nourishment from abiding in the one true vine as Yeshua spoke about in John 15. For the plants, water comes from the sky in the form of rain. It is interesting that there are two kinds of rain mentioned in the Bible the former rain, and the latter rain. The former rain is the rain that starts in the fall and softens the ground for plowing and planting. This is called Yoreh in Hebrew, and it comes from the same root as Torah. Torah is teaching and instruction, so this is the teaching rain. The teaching rain softens our heart and prepares us to receive the seed of the good news of the kingdom. The latter rain is in the spring, and it serves to bring the fruit to full maturity. It is called malkosh, which means to glean or harvest. To grow in faith, we need both kinds of watering. By staying close in fellowship and guarding our hearts, not allowing the negative influences to take root, we can starve them out. Taking every thought captive will also starve them out. The world is constantly competing for our attention, and we need to train our minds and turn our eyes and our hearts away from what is set before us every day. This is an act of work that we must do. It is commanded in many places. The fact that we must take responsibility for this is in 2 Corinthians 7, 1. Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. 1 Timothy 4, 7. But reject profane and old wives' fables and exercise yourself towards godliness. Ephesians 4.31, let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. The things we need to turn away from are clearly written. A brief survey of Proverbs will show you the pitfalls of human interaction. In addition to the list in Galatians 5, consider 2 Timothy 1.7, for God hath not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Sometimes there are subtle but repeated behavior patterns which show that our minds are not fixed on Yehovah. Finally, if once these negative spirits have taken hold of us, we must cast them out, just as Yeshua cast evil spirits out of people. If you have given the devil a foothold in any area, you need to repent and close that door. 
We are warned in Ephesians 4.27, neither give place, that is a foothold, to the devil. If we do not take measures to deal with our weeds, we will be subject to the process outlined in James 1.14-15. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Then when lust has conceived, it brings forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, brings forth death. We are cautioned to pull out the whole weed, because even the smallest shred of root in some plants will cause them to grow again. You might be familiar with trying to remove dandelions from your lawn. Their roots are deep, and they break all too easily. Soon the dandelions are back. As it says in Hebrews 12:15, Looking diligently, lest any man fail by the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. As Yeshua taught in John 15:5, I am the vine, you are the branches. He that abides in me, and I in him, the same brings forth much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. And what of the increase of 100-fold, 60-fold, and 30? Ought not it to have been 90, 60, 30? Well, some say this. Abraham was a 100 years old when Isaac was born. Isaac was 60 when Jacob was born, and Joseph was 30 when he began to rule in Egypt, just as Yeshua was 30 when he began his ministry. Though Abraham was accounted to for only one son, his increase is the greatest, and he is the father of all who believe. Halab, 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 halab,